Well, good morning. Thank you again for joining us as we come together to worship, and, and now we come really to the, to the pinnacle of our worship this morning as we open God's Word together. Um, it's, been, uh, it's been quite a study in Luke's Gospel where, where uh, we find ourselves um, kind of at the apex of, of the Gospel itself this morning as we come to... Th- the passage in Luke where we see our Lord and our Savior crucified. And uh, last week we made our way through verses 26 through 31 in Luke 23. And uh, we saw there that immediately after the judgment of the court was, was given, uh, Jesus is immediately led from the judgment seat to the place where he would be crucified. We saw there was a great multitude of people, as Luke puts it, who followed as Jesus is led to be put to death and how the women in the crowd were mentioned as mourning and lamenting over uh, what is happening. It wasn't that they were believers in Jesus. Uh, It wasn't that they were followers of his in any spiritual sense or even that they believed the decision of the court was wrong. But rather, they sympathized, much like we would sympathize if there were capital punishment here in Canada. We would sympathize with someone uh, accused of a crime, found guilty of a crime, and, and, and brought to, to the point of their execution. It's not that we disagree that the sentence is wrong, but we can still sympathize. And that's exactly what is happening here uh, with, with these. Um, they're sympathizing with Jesus in that he is about to be put to death on a Roman cross, which is um, a, a terrifying thing. Um, we have in our English language the word excruciating. Well, excruciating is a word that actually means out of the cross. That's where that word comes from. The cross is the very definition of excruciating pain. So they're sympathetic to what Jesus is about to go through. These were the very same crowd that had stood before Pilate and shouted, crucify him. And as Jesus is led away, unable to carry his cross, the uh, Roman soldiers forcibly uh, bring Simon the Cyrene out of that crowd and, and, uh, and have him carry the Lord's cross from that point all the way to the place of crucifixion. And, and we saw that Jesus, during his travel from the judgment seat to the crucifixion site, he turns to the crowd and he calls them out uh, in a pronouncement of judgment. Daughters of Jerusalem, it says in verse 28, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. In other words, you're weeping over the wrong thing here. You should rather be weeping as the result of the judgment that is going to come upon the nation because of your rejection of Christ. Much like the judgment that Jesus promised would come back in Luke chapter 21 in the Olivet Discourse, here as well we saw both a short-term and a long-term fulfillment of this prophetic statement. In the relatively near term, Just some 35 years after the Lord's crucifixion, Jesus speaks these words of destruction that are going to come upon Jerusalem at the hands of the Romans. And we know that actually does take place as the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. During that time, it it was just as Jesus spoke. People suffered immensely. So much so that Even blessing and curse were reversed, right? Jesus said, you know, today you call the woman who's barren cursed, but in that judgment, you're going to call her blessed. 
Because the destruction, the, the judgment that's coming is going to be so great that you would be cursed to have to watch your children go through that. And uh, so as we come to our text today, uh, uh, well, uh, before I move on, there, there's also a long-term fulfillment, and we saw that as well, long-term fulfillment, looking at the eschatological judgment that God is going to bring on the entire world of unbelievers at, in the end time. Uh, but as we press on in our text today, we come to the actual crucifixion of our Lord, and Luke is, is really fairly brief in his presentation of the Lord's crucifixion here, uh, but he does offer some details that the other gospel writers um, ignore. Uh, we will, once again, seek to bring in some of the information from the other, other gospel accounts to help us see the bigger picture, but we do want to primarily focus on what it is that Luke has to say here. And... Uh, we're only going to focus on a couple of verses this morning, um, beginning in Luke chapter 23, uh, verse 32. We read this. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified. There they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that's as far as I want to take it this morning. We, uh, we read these opening uh, verses last week to conclude our message, but we, we really didn't dig into them at all, um, into these events. Luke tells us as we begin our passage that two others, two criminals, he says, uh, were were led to be put to death along with Jesus. And that's all he tells us. They're criminals. Uh, he doesn't tell us what crimes they've been found guilty of committing. Uh, in the King James, it is translated as malefactors, uh, which simply means one who has committed a crime. Uh, as we look at Matthew and Mark's accounts, they both tell us that these men were, in fact, robbers. They were thieves. The problem for us here is crucifixion is not the normal penalty for thieves. So why are these guys being crucified if that is their only crime? Crucifixion was actually a penalty that was reserved for the most serious offenses where the Romans wanted to actually send a message to the people. A message saying, do not dare to follow in the crimes of these people. For example, the man that we looked at last week, the man Barabbas. Remember, Pilate brought this man out and presented him along with Jesus. Barabbas, we were told, was a man who was guilty of insurrection and murder. Barabbas was headed to a Roman cross. Now, Murder was a serious crime, of course, and certainly the Romans would have taken murder very seriously, but even more so is the charge of insurrection, rebellion. And, and not just rebellion, but leading a rebellion. Being involved in and even, even uh, being an a, a orchestrator of rebellion against the Roman authority in the region. This was the most serious offense that the Romans would have dealt with. And they would want to send a very, very strong, clear message to any who would even think about following in those footsteps. And so they would put the man on the cross to put him to death. Barabbas was to be crucified, and, and as the choice was given to the crowd of which man to release, Barabbas was freed of his future on that cross because Jesus was to take his place on that cross. Two men are presented here in our passage today, and though we don't know specifically, these two men are very likely partners with Barabbas in his crimes and very likely they were sentenced along with Barabbas 
In, uh, in John's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 40, we notice that Barabbas himself is actually called a robber. Jesus is led to the place of execution along with these two guilty men. Now, before the crucifixion, uh, because the crucifixion, rather, was a, a punishment that, uh, that was intentionally meant to, to be a special warning to other people not to partake in such crimes as the criminals, the guilty would be fastened to the cross in a very public place where most people could, where many, many, many people could actually see the sentence being carried out upon them. Normally, uh, the place of crucifixion would be along the highways and at the gates of the city so that the maximum number of people would see the guilty being executed. In uh, Luke 22, uh, 23, verse 33, it says, And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. We don't know exactly where it is that Jesus was crucified. Uh, the site uh, that some believe to be the place of the skull is a place where today there's a Roman Catholic church built on top of the site. But we don't know. Uh, other people claim other sites as a possible location. The truth is we don't know. Um, much like the tomb of Jesus, after the Lord's death and burial and resurrection, well, the place where he was killed really didn't matter all that much. And the place that he was buried really didn't matter all that much because he wasn't dead. He was alive. And so, in Christian history, we don't know where these sites are. Why? Because Christians didn't make a big deal out of them. They didn't set up shrines. Nothing like that. Because our Lord is not dead. He is alive. That's interesting to think about, isn't it? I want you to think about every other religion in the world, including Judaism. They mark their grave sites. Right? We read in the New Testament even. And now this is, uh, at this point, we would be talking 1,500 years later. Um, we, the Jews still knew where Jacob's tomb was. They still knew where Rachel's tomb was. Right? The place of death was very important. And yet, these Jews, when Jesus died, they didn't mark his grave because he's alive. Every other religion in the world, the, 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 uh, Islam, they celebrate the place where Muhammad is buried. Um, but not Christianity. So we don't know where this place that is called the skull, is located. All we really know is it's a place called the skull. The place of the skull. And we don't really know why. Uh, some would speculate about this, uh, that it might have been labeled such because many of the people who were put to death in this place were actually beheaded, and there were a lot of skulls lying around this site. Uh, some that hold to this view would include, for example, uh, Jerome, the early church historian and translator of the Latin Vulgate. But this seems a rather unlikely reason because the Jewish culture would not have allowed all those skulls laying around just outside of the city gates. Uh, others and, and uh, very well-known Christians in Christian history, men like Origen and Tertullian and Athanasius and Augustine hold to the view that the place of the skull is actually the place where Adam was buried. Seems unlikely, since we don't really know where Adam was buried, and Adam's burial place is never mentioned in Scripture. So, seems unlikely. The Jews certainly would have uh, marked that site had it been the case. Most likely this place, the place of the skull, is referred to this way because it's a hill uh, 
Uh, and the Romans, we know, they wanted the maximum number of people to see the man on the cross. And so probably they would have set up these execution sites on elevated sites where the accused would be visible to the most people possible. And uh, they, so they would, they would execute on highways, probably on a raised hill alongside the highway, and uh, this place, some say, was a place uh, that rose up out of the surrounding countryside resembling a skull, probably a rocky hill protruding from the ground. The place of the skull in Aramaic is Golgotha. So if you hear that name, that's what it refers to. In Latin, it's the word Calvaria, from which we get Calvary. In the Gospel accounts, this is all it really says about the place of the skull, the place where Jesus is crucified. It's never actually referred to as a mount or a hill anywhere in the Gospels. And the earliest record of it actually being said to be on a hill is found in the writings of the 3rd century. And then later in the 6th century is the first place it is ever referred to as Mount Calvary. So we don't know where this location was. But we do know that it was near enough to the city gate that those who were entering and those who were exiting the city could actually read the sign that Pontius Pilate had uh, installed on the top of the cross above Jesus' head. So it had to be very, very near to the city gate. Uh, when they came to this place, there it says, they crucified the Lord. Along with him, two criminals, one on his left, one on his right. This is a literal fulfillment of Isaiah 53, verse 12, which says that he was numbered with the transgressors. Verse 34 here is where I really want to focus this morning because this is such a powerful statement and uh, I, I will not do it justice, but I, I will seek to, to try. Verse 34 says, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is a monumental statement. Here, as our Lord is crucified, we read the very first of His seven sayings on the cross, and with his very first words on the cross, our Lord begins his work of intercession. As our Lord himself is in the agony of the cross, he remembers us. He remembers sinners in his prayer. He remembers even his murderers, in his prayer. He prays that sinners be forgiven, which is, of course, the whole reason for the cross, is it not? I saw someone asking a question online this past week, which was to this effect. Is there any way to say Christ died for all without being a universalist? And that's a question really that comes from a church culture that has just done a really poor job of teaching truth. And the answer is no. There is no way to say Christ died for all without presenting a universalist gospel. What does the scripture say? Well, it says that Christ died to save sinners. And since we all fall into the category of sinners, that means it doesn't matter who you are, there is hope found in Christ for all. Well, here, our question might be slightly different. Here, our question would be, can we tell people that Christ prayed for all? And again, the answer is no. But we can tell people that Christ did pray for sinners. He does intercede for sinners. 
He has such great compassion for sinners. And because you're a sinner, like I'm a sinner, there's hope to be found for all in Christ. And we'll come back to this idea in a few minutes. We do need to to come to the text asking a question. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And uh, the question that I want to present for you here is, who are they? For whom Jesus asks the Father for forgiveness. Some people would just brush this off and, and move right past this without even thinking about it. Well, they must mean everybody. Well, let's consider it, though. Some people have approached this text and said, well, they here refers to the Roman soldiers. Remember, Jesus is being crucified, and the Roman soldiers are the ones carrying out the death sentence. And as they pound the nails through his hands and his feet, Jesus is praying for the Roman soldiers. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know anything about the Messiah. They don't know anything about the Jewish Scriptures, the Word of God. They're Gentiles without access to the Word of God, and therefore they are ignorant of what they are doing and who they are executing. So Jesus must be praying for these. Those who would hold to this view would make the case that judgment on the nation of Israel, and remember we looked at that last week in our text, judgment on the nation of Israel has already been declared by Jesus and thus forgiveness to the nation of Israel is no longer available. So Jesus can't be praying for the Jews. He must then be praying for the Gentiles. So Jesus is praying for the Roman soldiers. But that cannot be the case. First of all, the Romans have not been explicitly mentioned at all. The soldiers who crucified him are mentioned in a few more verses, but up to this point and immediately after this, it's entirely Jews that are the focus. It would be very unlikely for Luke's readers to come to the idea that Jesus is praying for the Roman soldiers here, this prayer has to be primarily for the Jews. Though readers might well apply it to all who play a role in the Lord's crucifixion, we see a parallel prayer, for example, that is, I think, very helpful for us in Acts chapter 7, verse 6. This is Stephen who is martyred. And uh, Stephen prayed a prayer, and I want to ask you where he learned this prayer. Here's what Stephen prayed. Lord, do not hold their sins against them. That is a prayer for the Jews who were putting Stephen to death. Where did Stephen learn to pray like that for those who were murdering him? He, He learned it from his Lord who prayed for those who were murdering him. This, is all, this almost requires that the prayer here be for the Jews who have brought the Lord to this place for this reason. But the next thing that I would point to is found in Peter's words in Acts chapter 3 as he tells of the crucifixion of Jesus as he's sharing the gospel in the temple. Let me read for you a portion of Acts chapter 3, verses 13 to 19. It says this, The God of Abraham... The God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, 
that his Christ would suffer, uh, sorry, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Were the Jews ignorant? Well, according to Peter, they were. In fact, even the rulers of the Jews who demanded Christ be put to death, according to Peter, they were ignorant. They know not what they do. Um, We can also look at Paul's words. Paul's words found in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, it says this, None of the rulers of this age understand this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Were the Jews ignorant? Did the Jews know what they were doing? And the answer, according to the New Testament, seems to be no. They, they, they were, uh, yes, they were ignorant. They did not know what they were doing. The prayer of Jesus here then must apply to the Jews, as well as, of course, to the Romans. The third thing that I would point out here is found in the prophecy that we've already looked at, found in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12. It says this, that he, this one who would be crushed by God, it says he makes intercession for the transgressors. Jesus actually intercedes for those who are his enemies who are putting him to death. Now, some push the nation of Israel's rejection of Jesus so far as to say their fate is sealed, as judgment has already been prophesied, but we need to realize that doesn't really fit the teaching of the New Testament. If forgiveness of sins is not available to Israel, then I would ask the question, why did every single one of the apostles preach repentance to the nation of Israel. Everyone, including Paul, who was the apostle to the Gentiles, they all preached and called Israel to repent and come to faith in Christ. If Israel's judgment is already prophesied and therefore they cannot be forgiven, then the apostles should have packed their bags and moved out of Israel. But they didn't. It's not what we see. Daryl Bach, in his work in his exegetical, exegetical commentary on Luke's gospel, he writes this, The ignorance that Jesus attributes to the nation is not a lack of knowledge, but an erroneous judgment about God's activity. Since the apostles will call the nation to repent for this ignorance as Jesus had warned them. The issue of national forgiveness is then not an obstacle since individuals can still respond. As to the inevitability of national catastrophe, Jesus is not asking for the judgment on the nation to be put off. The national consequences stand. And I think what Bach writes there is very helpful for us as we consider this question of who is it that Jesus is praying for here? There is a sense in which this is a general prayer for those responsible for his death on the cross. But, and you know what? The details are always found in those little buts, right? But, right? Uh, in in, uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter, four, uh, chapter 2, we read of how we're dead in our transgressions, right? We're, we're all following the, the, pow- the prince of the power of the air. And it says, but God. So there's a, there's a but here as well. This is indeed a general prayer for those responsible for putting t- Jesus to death. But there is still a problem. If Jesus is praying to his father, to forgive all of these who act in ignorance and put him on the cross, including the rulers of the Jews who brought him before Pilate, presented false charges, knowingly presented an innocent man to be put to death, 
demanded, even after Pilate examined him and declared him innocent, that he be killed, persuaded the crowd to call for his execution. Here's my question. If Jesus prays for all of these, wouldn't all of these be forgiven then? I mean, Jesus is God the Son. We find something of value to consider in John chapter 17 as Jesus prays just before raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus prays this, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, the eternal Son of God, who for all of eternity has been in perfect, loving relationship with His Father in perfect unity of thought and will and action is always heard by His Father when He prays. And further, His Father always answers His prayers in the affirmative. Because they're in perfect unity of spirit and purpose and will. So if Jesus asks the Father to forgive all who are putting him to death, we would have to include then, we, we would have to, to, uh, to, to gather from that then that every single one of them would have been forgiven. So, though this is indeed a general prayer for all responsible for his death, there is a very special intercession here that we can't ignore. This prayer, though general, in, uh, in, in, in general terms, can really be applied to all people who are present. It is only effectual for those for whom Jesus specifically prays. The only ones here who actually receive forgiveness are those specifically for whom Jesus intercedes. Our problem as we read the text is that we don't really know who in that crowd these people are. But God does. Let me read for you from MacArthur's commentary because I think this is helpful. He says this, Christ's petition was in one sense a general prayer revealing that there is no sin against the Son of God so severe that it cannot be forgiven those who repent. If forgiveness is available for those who crucified Him, it is available for anyone. But it is also a specific prayer that God would forgive those among the crowd whom He had chosen before the foundation of the world to save. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 Jews in Jerusalem were converted to Christ and baptized and the church was born. Within a few weeks, another 5,000 or more people in Jerusalem embraced faith in Jesus Christ. Surely many of these who came to Christ in those Few, first few weeks after the resurrection were there in the crowd that day at Calvary. The church was in large measure born out of those who stood there and mocked the Son of God in answer to this very prayer. The centurion and the soldiers under his command also came to faith in Christ, as did many of the priests according to Acts 6 possibly even some of the rulers, and even one of the hardened criminals crucified alongside our Savior. Uh, this is not an isolated opinion of John MacArthur. John Calvin also shared this same opinion, um, that Jesus prayed in a general sense for all who persecuted Him on this occasion. Calvin writes this, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them by this expression, Christ gave evidence that He was the mild and gentle Lamb 
which was to be led out to be sacrificed, as Isaiah the prophet had foretold. For not only does he abstain from revenge, but pleads with God the Father for the salvation of those by whom he is most cruelly tormented. For when Christ was moved by a free, uh, a feeling of compassion to ask for forgiveness from God for his persecutors, this did not hinder him from acquiescing to the righteous judgment of God, which he knew to be ordained for reprobate and obstinate men. Thus, when Christ saw that both the Jewish people and the soldiers raged against him with blind fury, Though their ignorance was not excusable, he had pity on them and presented himself as their intercessor. Yet, knowing that God would be an avenger, he left to him the exercise of judgment against the desperate. Yet Calvin, as he continues in laying out his understanding of the text, he also writes this. It is probable, however that Christ did not pray for all indiscriminately, but only for the wretched multitude who were carried away by inconsiderate zeal and not by premeditated wickedness. For since the scribes and the priests were persons in regard to whom no ground was left for hope, it would have been in vain for him to pray for them." Nor can it be doubted that this prayer was heard by the Heavenly Father and that this was the cause why many of the people afterwards drank by faith the very blood which they themselves had shed. So we see Calvin likewise sees this as both a general prayer for all who are persecuting, but at the same time a very specific prayer for specifically God's elect. J.C. Ryle Likewise writes this, The fruits of this wonderful prayer will never be fully seen until the day when the books are opened and the secrets of all hearts are revealed. We have probably not the least idea how many of the conversions to God at Jerusalem, Jerusalem which took place during the first six months after the crucifixion were the direct reply to this marvelous prayer. Because this prayer was the first steps toward the penitent thief's, uh, perhaps this prayer was the first steps toward the penitent thief's repentance. Perhaps it was one means of, of, of affecting the centurion who declared our Lord to be a righteous man and the people who smote their breasts and returned. Perhaps the 3,000 converted on the day of Pentecost. Foremost, it may be at one time among our Lord's murderers owed their conversion to this very prayer. The day will declare it. There is nothing secret that shall not be revealed. This only we know, that the Father hears the Son always. We may be sure that His wonderful prayer was indeed heard. Good words from those men. Um, there is a sense in which this is a general prayer for all sinners, for all who, are, who were persecuting our Lord on this day, and yet it's a very specific prayer for the Lord's elect. As we examine the first words of our Lord recorded on His cross, we see a prayer offered most likely as the nails were being driven into His wrists and feet or as that cross was first hoisted up into its position, what we see is as soon as our Savior's blood on His cross began to flow, our Savior began His work of interceding for sinners. Let us not take that lightly. Let us not pass by this quickly without stopping to give our God much praise and worship. I praise God that He intercedes for sinners. You see, that is really, really good news for me and for you because we are sinners. Let me quote once again from Ryle here. He says this, let us see in our Lord's intercession for those who crucified Him one more proof of Christ's infinite love to sinners. 
The Lord Jesus is indeed most pity-filled, most compassionate, most gracious. None are too wicked for Him to care for. None are too far gone for His almighty heart to take interest about their souls. He wept over unbelieving Jerusalem. He heard the prayer of the dying thief. He stopped under the tree to call the publican Zacchaeus. He came down from heaven to turn the heart of the persecutor Saul. He found time to pray for even his murderers as they put him on the cross. Love like this is a love that passeth knowledge. The vilest of sinners has no cause to be afraid to apply to a Savior like this. If we warrant an, an encouragement to repent and believe, the passage before us, says Ryle, surely supplies enough. Oh, sinners, we can come to Christ. He is compassionate to sinners. But let me push this slightly further here. A generic prayer of intercession for sinners, of which I am one, a generic prayer falls short of my need. You see, the problem with this is that I also realize there are sinners who are not going to be saved. So the truth that Jesus intercedes for sinners generically is not enough. I need to know that he intercedes for me personally. That he intercedes specifically for those he saves. When it comes right down to it, as we know that Christ died for His sheep, for those whom the Father had chosen before the foundation of the world to save, so it is Christ's intercession is specifically for these same people. It's for God's elect. The Lord intercedes for sinners here, and yet we know that not all sinners are going to be forgiven. Not all sinners in that crowd on that day would have been forgiven, but only those specifically for whom Christ interceded personally. And sinners, Christ has proven Himself to be a Savior of such great love and, and compassion that no matter what it is you've done, no matter how heinous your sin may be, He will not turn you away. But you do have to come on His terms. You see, He only intercedes for sinners. And if you would have Him intercede for you, you must come to Him as a sinner. Come with nothing in your hands but faith and repentance and call out to this Son of God so filled with compassion and grace for men who are sinners like you and me. And call to Him. He will hear your prayer and He will not turn you away. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says. He makes the case that because Jesus died and because Jesus was buried and because Jesus rose again, because He is now and forevermore will be at the right hand of the Father in glory, the writer of Hebrews says this, Hebrews 7 verse 25, Consequently, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. Why? Since He always lives to make intercession for them. Isn't that good? It's not that he once at that time made intercession, but it is that he now and forever makes intercession for sinners, generally, but specifically for his elect. 
Um, if I could ask one of the ushers to go down and let them know that the kids can come up at this time. We want them to be up for testimonies we're going to hear of Christ's work in people's lives and then as we partake in communion together as well. Listen, in Christ, in Christ, you will find a Savior who is mighty to save. He is able to save and He is willing to save. All because He lives to make intercession personally and specifically for His people. Is that not exactly what we need? We need a Savior who can intercede with God Himself for us on our behalf. But let me share with you one more passage this morning. In its context, it is so much more than what I am going to even begin to scratch the surface on, but it certainly does speak to this issue of what Christ's intercession means for all who come to Him by faith and are in Christ. Romans chapter 8, verses 34 to 39 says this, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Why? Because He makes intercession for us. Specifically for us. For His people. For those, just before this passage it said, those whom God foreknew He called, and those He called He justified, and those He justified He is going to glorify. For us, His people, all who are in Christ, our Savior is interceding for us. You see, our security is completely found in that truth. For those who are in Christ, there will never be one second for all of the rest of history to come. There will never be one second when our Savior is not interceding for us. And because of this truth, we can rest in the fact that there will never be a day ever when we are found to be outside of God's love for us in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this great truth that your Son, our Savior, intercedes for sinners, that He has compassion towards sinners, that He invites sinners to come to Himself. But more so, Father, I, I thank You that Your Son intercedes personally for Your people. Father, that forgiveness of sins is available to Your people because Your Son paid the price in our place and your Son has asked you for our forgiveness and you have given to your Son as He has requested. And we thank you. We praise you, Father, for such a great Savior. And Father, we pray that you would bless us now as we hear testimonies of how indeed you have worked savingly in men and women's lives. Father, we pray this for your glory, for your honor, in Jesus' name, amen.